What's going on guys, it's Simo. So today I'm bringing you a video on how to beat Salamangre. Earlier in the week we did an introduction to Salamangre, kind of covering all the cards in depth, following that up with a Salamangre combo tutorial, showing just what this deck is capable of doing with only one or two cards. But now we're gonna be covering some more in-depth strategies and cards that are going to be very effective for combating this particular matchup. Because Salamangre is slated to be in the tier one slot based off the results we've already seen and with YCS Dusseldorf right around the corner you're gonna want to have as much information as you can going up against this matchup but before we get into it if you haven't already be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you guys don't miss a single upload and if you really love the content that I produce on this channel consider supporting me on patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member because it's thanks to people like Justin that I'm able to bring you this content on a daily basis so if you're interested hit the join button down below or check out the links in the description. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. So kicking things off, we're going to start off with cards that are good for going first. Now, again, this is going to solely depend on what type of deck you're playing and what room you can accommodate in either your main or side deck. So do keep that in mind. We're going to be covering as many cards as possible. So starting off, since we're going first, the best cards for going first are typically more floodgate-ish style stun cards. And the best one, at least in my opinion, is there can be only one. Now, the reason for this is because Salamangrids comprised of pretty much an entire higher archetype that's just one type of monster, meaning that if you flip there can be only one, they're not really going to be able to play the game. They can't control more than two monsters, or rather more than one monster, that's going to be of the cyburst type, and if the entire deck's made up of that, well, that's going to suck for them. But the other thing I really like about this is not only can you use it proactively, you can also use it reactively in the sense that even if you're going second and you draw into this card, you can set it into your opponent's board, then as they start going off with their plays doing whatever they want, you can just flip it and then they have to send all the cyber monsters on the field to the graveyard because that's how this card works. It works very similarly to something like Rivalry or Gozen Match and that is extremely, extremely powerful. So having that sort of flexibility in either the going first or going second category in terms of either setting it before they establish a board or setting it into an established board is really, really cool. You do have to worry about the counter trap but if you can bait that out, you should be perfectly fine. Now another good Floodgate is Artifact Sanctum. Now I know this isn't specifically a Floodgate, but Artifact Scythe is too good to pass up here because Scythe shutting down the extra deck entirely really puts the brakes on this deck because Salaman Great without its extra deck is just a deck of monsters that, yeah, they have good graveyard recursion, have the ability to generate some fairly decent advantage and it's fairly consistent, but what are you actually doing? This is a deck that very much so relies on the extra deck and with Scythe's ability to shut down the deck entirely, that's pretty good. Not to mention you can play something like Trap Trick, meaning you're gonna have access to six copies of it if you really want to, to ensure that you see it on that turn one. This is something you definitely should not underestimate. It also has good coverage in other matchups as well, like your Thunder Dragon or your Sky Striker to just shut them out as well. So that's pretty good. Another good card though is Summon Limit. Summon Limit has started to pick up a little steam as well. Basically it makes it so that only players can summon two times per turn and that means that if they go something like Summon Gazelle, Send Spinny, Resurrect Spinny, well guess what? That's two summons you flip Summon Limit and that's the end of their turn. Because it's a combo deck and just has to go through so many steps to actually set up its end board, Summon Limit can be very effective and if you play a deck that doesn't have as many steps in terms of assembling its win condition, you you could actually play under this card yourself and that's going to be pretty good for you. The one thing I don't like about it is that it doesn't really do anything if they're already established so you really need to see this card turn one for it to be particularly effective. Now another set of cards I want to talk about in the going first slot are cards that kind of go after the graveyard specifically and I'm talking about stuff like Necro Valley. I mean you could arguably side Necro Valley because it's a field spell you can search it with terraforming so it's like you have like five copies effectively. That's pretty damn good shutting down the ability for them to use any of their graveyard recursion abilities I mean it shuts off spinny it shuts off Jack Jaguar it shuts off the ability for the trap to be recurred it shuts off sunlight wolf from being able to recur resources there's 
there's so much recursion in this deck, so being able to shut down cards like that with Necro Valley can be really potent if your deck can play under the card fairly well. You also have some workarounds, stuff like Silent Graveyard and Abyss Dweller. Those only specifically target effects at activating Graveyard, but if that's all you need, that might be the perfect tool for that given situation. And then last but not least for the going first cards, we have something like Macrocosmos. This is pretty much always going to be on here when we have a graveyard centric strategy because if everything's getting banished that gets sent to the graveyard, they're not going to be able to recur the resources, meaning their strategy is just going to cripple entirely. So if your deck can play Macrocosmos, which I know not a lot can, but even so, if you draw it in your opening hand, you set up a board and flip Macro, that just might be enough to win you the game right there. So that's it for the going first cards, but now I want to talk about the going second cards because I feel like these cards are not only more effective against the Salamangrate matchup in particular, they're a lot more reactive, so it kind of forces your opponent to waste resources, and they have a little bit of wider coverage in other matchups. So first off are hand traps, and I think one of the best hand traps against this matchup actually is DD Crow. Now this is a card that goes in and out of formats when we're in very specific points, but DD Crow actually can be this deck's downfall for several different reasons. Because it relies so much on recurring particular resources out of the graveyard, if you use DD Crow to, let's say, hit something like a Spinny, or you can hit the Salamangrate Roar, the counter trap card, they're not gonna be able to recur that, and then it doesn't matter if they assemble a board, because if they don't have the trap, what are they really gonna be doing? Most of the time, these decks only run one singular copy of the Salamangrate Roar trap card, so if you banish it, you really have nothing to worry about for the rest of the game, or even hitting a Spinny can prevent them from getting to that combo in the first place. Crow just has a lot of versatility here, and then if you look at other matchups as well, you can hit Ray and Sky Strikers, and that makes me want to bring up a card like Called by the Grave for the very same reason. Now, Called by the Grave may not be able to hit Salamangrate Roar, but it can hit all the monsters just like DD Crow can, and being able to negate their effects for the duration of the turn can be quite effective. Not to mention Salamangrate does run a lot of hand traps because they have the room to accommodate them. So you've got a little bit more versatility there as well. If you don't want to use it on a Salamangrate card, you can use it to stop a hand trap to make sure your plays get pushed through. A few other hand traps though that are worth mentioning. Ash Blossom can be very good against this deck if you hit something like Mirage Stallio. Mirage Stallio is kind of like a point where if they don't really have an extender, they can't really do a whole lot if they don't get that extra monster onto the board. That means they can't get to their Sunlight Wolf. And honestly, their turn could just end flat out right there. So that could be pretty good. Ash is just pretty good in general at stopping a lot of different decks just because pretty much every competitive deck searches in some capacity. So you really can't go wrong there. Effect Veiler and Infinite Impermanence are also not bad options just being able to stop a wide variety of effects in the deck. Most notably something like Sunlight Wolf solely because of the fact it has two very powerful recursion effects. And if they don't have the ability to use those recursion effects, you're gonna be pretty safe when you go into your turn because they haven't really accrued any advantage. They haven't gotten their counter trap onto the field, different things like that because they might've played their turn out a lot differently had you not had that effect negation. So you could also hit stuff like Mirage Stallio as well so they don't even get to that point. There's just a lot of really good places that Veiler and Impermanence can work very well. Speaking of Sunlight Wolf though, you could theoretically use Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries against Sunlight Wolf because the card is that crucial to the deck's success. And without Sunlight Wolf, the deck loses a lot of its recursion, a lot of its ability to kind of just push forward. So by just Reapering the Cherries, you're perfectly fine. And that honestly might just be enough. Reaper is just very specific sometimes. And a lot of the times you have to make room in your extra deck. But if you don't really care about your extra deck, if you're playing something like Draco or another stun strategy and you can fit Reaper, that might be something you want to consider. And the other hand trap I do want to talk about is Fantastical Dragon Phantasme, because this deck can very easily have two or more link monsters on the field, meaning when you drop Phantasme, you're going to draw three cards, put two back, you have a monster now on the field to protect yourself in any given circumstance, and you probably dug into maybe more hand traps potentially like the aforementioned cards, or just more cards that you need so that when play passes back to you, you're going to be able to completely overrun your opponent. So definitely not a bad option there. But hand traps aside, I do want to talk about some other strategies, and that's focusing on the Salamangrate strategy itself. Now, one of the big things here is that Salamangrate Roar requires 
requires a link monster to be on the field in order for you to activate it. So with that being the case, if you remove the link monster, you kind of just make the trap dead and you don't have to worry about it in either case. So something like a Kaiju could be very perfect here because you just slap it on over whatever link monster they have left on the field. It pretty much shuts down Salaman Great Roar and then you can pretty much do whatever you want. I mean, yeah, they might have other traps, but at least you kind of just did a one for two type of solution because you remove the Sunlight Wolf and then you also stop the trap, or at least for the duration of that turn, assuming that is their only Salamangrate Link monster. So that can be pretty good. That's kind of like, you know, taking a play out of going against Sky Striker's book, but still very effective nonetheless. You can also do something like Mind Control to target the Sunlight Wolf or any sort of targeting effect that might threaten whatever Link monster they have, meaning they're going to have to use the Salamangrate Roar or something to pretty much enter it because if they don't, the trap becomes dead and they're not going to have any value there. So pretty much it's going to put them in that awkward position that you can just force out the roar and then you can go on with the rest of your plays. Now some other strategies you can incorporate are going after the back row directly because remember, they're not just going to have Salamangrate Rage and Salamangrate Roar. They might have stuff like Solemn Strike, Solemn Warning, Infinite Impermanence of their own. You're usually going to be dealing with more than just those Salamangrate traps. So if you're playing something like Thunder or an OTK deck, you've got Denko Sek at your disposal. And then there's also something like Red Reboot. Red Reboot can just pretty much shut their entire back row out entirely at the cost of half your life points from your hand, sure. But if you're going to kill them that turn, that's perfectly fine since a lot of their disruption comes from their back row and in the hand, not necessarily the monsters they have on the field. So keep that in mind if you're playing a very heavy OTK centric strategy that those cards could be your best friend. You also have traditional options like Twin Twisters as well. That kind of just forces out the negation. And then you also have something like Dino Wrestler Pankratops. Pankratops is so good because basically you can just attack over the Link monster and bait out the Bay Links. And then that's just a big beater you have on the field. And you always have Pankratops' effect that you can use in response to anything. So that if you can find a way to navigate the rest of their field, or if you know specifically where they set that Salaman Great Roar, you can even bait it out with Pankratops' effect after getting the Bay Links out of their graveyard, and then you can just go ahead and set up the rest of your field and maybe clear theirs. Just keep in mind that you definitely want to make sure that you have some follow-up because they're going to most likely have Gazelle in their hand. So guys, those are just my thoughts. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about your other cards and strategies for beating Salamangrate. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member because just by showing your support in any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. So thanks so much again and we'll see you next time.